Hello, everyone, and welcome to this BioExcel virtual workshop on best practices in QMM simulation of biomolecular systems. So, why are we organizing this workshop? Well, we know that there is a significant interest in the use of hybrid QMM simulation methods for biomolecular modeling and simulation. In fact, BioExcel recently conducted a survey which showed that 50% of respondents um, significantly were hindered in their use of QMM by not knowing how to choose suitable QM parameters. So although we know that there's a significant interest in the use of QMM, there are also barriers to people being able to, to use QMM. And these barriers relate not only to the use of software to perform QMM simulation, but also, as we've identified, to knowing how to choose a good QM treatment. Um, there is a caveat to doing QMM simulation. A simulator must beware that it is dangerous to use out-of-the-box available QM um, functionality in software without knowing what it entails. So it is dangerous in general to use QM software uh, as a black box. So we asked ourselves, how can BioExcel help in this area? So to do so, we organized this workshop. Uh, we originally intended to have an in-person workshop, but of course, as like everything, we had to we had to take an alternative approach. So we've decided uh, to have a series of webinars followed by a panel discussion. The goals of the workshop are to enable um, experienced QMM biomolecular simulators to share their insights and experience of what is con what is best practice uh, for doing QMM simulation of biomolecular systems. That refers to the underlying uh, methodology, um, including theoretical aspects, uh, but also a lot of the tricky practical aspects, which are often not described in literature. The idea is that this would help share experience by warning of pitfalls and highlighting things to do as well as not to do, um, both in general terms, but also based around the specific research experience that each speaker has. Uh, in applying QMM in their particular area of study. So for their particular biomolecular systems of interest and the particular research questions they're interested in asking. Now, the aim is that this would benefit the wider community of computational biomolecular researchers, uh, in particular, those who might be less experienced in using QMM. Um, and we want to use this, use this as an opportunity to also identify common perspective in applying QMM in different areas. The format of the workshop, as I said already, is going to be a, a series of uh, webinars by six invited speakers. Today's speaker has, has also been invited, but he's a co-organizer um, to kick off, so I've not listed, uh, listed him here. Um, these webinars will take, take place over the next few months. Uh, there is now an event page for the workshop on the BioExcel website uh, listed there, um, so you can find more information there and the full schedule of the webinars will be up in the near future. Before I hand over to Gerrit, who's our speaker today, to kick off the workshop as a whole uh, with his webinar, I want to just tell you a little bit about um, uh, the session, how to ask questions. So a key part of the workshop is that we want to allow people who are attending to ask the speakers uh, to, to, to reflect on their advice on best practice based on their experience. So to that end, we really want to encourage you to ask questions at the end. Now to do so in GoToWebinar, um, if you see the GoToWebinar control panel that's pictured here, uh, there's a questions uh, box. So feel free at any point uh, during the webinar to enter your question there. Uh, we will deal with them after the, after the main presentation. Um, and I will give you the opportunity to ask a question by, by audio, um, by default. If you don't have audio, please mention it um, because that will speed things up. Then I will just read out your question to Gerrit. So today's kickoff webinar for the workshop will be presented by my BioExile colleague, Gerrit Groenhoff, who's based in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Juvascula in Finland. And he focuses on uh, application of QMM and other other approaches for the development um, of simulation techniques for investigating reactivity, enzymology, uh, and, and photoreactive processes. So I will hand over now 
to head. Okay, thank you. So the, the title is a little bit boring. Um, it, it is just the title of this, the kickoff web webinar. And what I want to do, so Anna already announced the general idea. So we have a, a number of, of excellent speakers who all are very experienced QMM users. They all, I hope at least, have their own vision on what is best practices. And then after these uh, webinars or seminars, I hope that during the panel discussion, we can all come together and formulate some, some practical advices on, on how to do QMM. Because as Arno said, uh, we could identify some severe problems, in particular for beginning users, in applying QMM. So as Arno said, I'm Gerard Groenhoff. I, I work in Uvescular. On the top picture of your slides, which you can now see with my arrow, that is where I work. I'm actually currently standing approximately where the arrow is. Now, it's not always like this. It's not always winter, winter wonderland. We also have summer. For example, this year it was on a Tuesday, and it was great. Um, but most of the time, we're anyway inside forming computations or experiments. All right, so to get started is, is, is why this best practices workshop. And I don't already answered that question. So we conducted the survey. Uh, and, and from the survey, well, we, we inferred that there is a need for such, for such workshops. So rather than focusing on, on, on what you can do with it, rather focus on how you can do it, and more importantly, how you can know that what you have done is, is, is was the right thing. So, but before I start that, why QMM simulations? Well, QMM simulations basically allow you to do an experiment, a real chemistry experiment, where you're changing chemical bonds, where you make new products uh, without test tubes, so you don't get your fingers dirty. Well, depending on how clean you keep your keyboard, of course. Um, and it allows one to observe the famous wiggling and jiggling of the atoms, which are underlying, for example, all of life. And the latter is very hard experimentally. So I show here an example of two, two typical experiments that is used a lot in, in, in the biological community. And the first is crystallography. And I hope you recognize the diffraction pattern here. It gives you unprecedented spatial resolution. You can see where the atoms are sitting. So in terms of resolution, in terms of seeing the atoms, we don't really have a problem. In spectroscopy, yeah, with femtosecond laser pulses, well, that is the, precisely the chemical relevant time scales at which chemical reactions occur, at least where the bone breaking occurs once you have the transition state, for example. We can also reach the time resolution. We can probe how the system is changing over time after the reaction is initiated with femtosecond laser pulses. Um, the problem is, of course, in, in of not of course, you may or may not know that in spectroscopy, the only thing you're sensitive for is changes of energy levels. So you see how the energy levels change as a function of time since the reaction has started. So it doesn't give you any spatial insight into what's going on because you don't know which atomic motions correlate with the change in the energy levels. Conclusion, experimentally, most of the time, we can either get the high spatial resolution, but then we don't see much moving, or we can get high time resolution, but then we still don't see much moving because we don't see those atoms. So this is where computer simulations can provide uh, uh, an, an alternative and complement both these types of experiments because you can actually compute and the motion of the atoms and even chemical reactions if you do QMM. But as is little to Martians uh, experience, sometimes the computer simulation is also not really working. Now I'm sure they're going to debug the sec fault uh, uh, while I give this presentation, but nevertheless, so we have techniques at our disposal, computational techniques at our disposal, to complement experiment and provide a dynamic picture to link up these two regimes of experimentalists. Why this workshop? So as Arnold said, is that QM is a very powerful technique, but it's not a magic bullet. It's not a black bullet. It's not the solution to all of your problems because there are a lot of little details that are often not discussed. In particular, when you present your QM work, you want to only focus on the success of it. You're not going to talk much about the details, how much time you spend validating the method that you have chosen. For example, 90%, um, and I think I'm, I make a rough estimate here, but I would say that 90% of all the time we invest in a project that leads to a publication, 90% of that time is actually ending up in material and supporting information that nobody reads. I was actually, in preparing this talk, picking up some old papers and looking at the website, uh, how many times the supporting information was accessed. I almost had to cry. You do your best to make this nice supporting information and X number of accesses, one after four years. So it means people not reading the supporting information. Nevertheless, that is where most of, the, most of the effort actually goes into, because that is where you demonstrate to the reader, and to the reviewer, uh, but of course, mostly to the reader, how the method was validated. What were the motivations for choosing the, the, the level of theory that was used in the work? So that is what we want to, what I hope this workshop is going to lead to. That we're all going to openly discuss all these details and, and, and make them common good. Then 
very important for those of you who, who are considering using QMMM in their work at a certain point um, is can this is QMM the tool for you? Yeah, I can imagine that you're working together you know, in a team and, and, and there is an interesting, let's say, enzyme with an interesting mutation or interesting properties and you would like to know more. And of course, then oh, maybe we can do QMM. To decide if this maybe is a B or a not B, that is one of the things this workshop should, should, should try to address. Yeah? And then finally, it's also to help you decide. So if you know, or if you have decided that QMM is the method for your problem, then how to choose the right QMM parameters. So how to choose something, model that others are, that, that's gonna actually have value. So these are the targets, these are the goals of this workshop. And to, to address these, these questions, uh, well, we have invited six speakers, and of course, they are not forced to, uh, to address these questions, but I hope that in the panel discussion at the end, we can actually discuss these things based on the webinars that you're going to see. Okay, so what was QMM again? I hope I'm telling something that everybody is now gonna, everybody is now gonna fall asleep. But nevertheless, what is it again? Just to get started. So you try to join the best of both worlds. Of course, in practice, you may also end up with the worst of both worlds, but you try now to join quantum chemistry, which is in principle, first principle. So you don't have to make any assumptions uh, or, or force field of parameterizations. And you can describe chemistry, you can describe molecules, you can describe bond breaking, but it's expensive. So you can only use typically small systems. And you want to combine this with the power of molecular mechanics, which is over well, I'm not saying over, but it's very heavily parameterized, it's very efficient, and provides a, a good model for a large system. So this way you can actually get the best of both worlds, describing a large system with force field, that means the rest of the protein, and only that part where the chemistry is changing, so where the electrons play an important role, only that part you treat by quantum mechanics. And then you have lots of choices. You can use up initio, density functional theory, a lot of other methods that are at your disposal. And this idea, as you mentioned, was coined almost as old as I am many years ago uh, and led them to receive Nobel Prize in recognition for this contribution. Now, basically, from the survey and talking to people and also checking, uh, also what, what, what people email me when they're interested in using Chromex for QMM, is what, is what people want is something that can read in the enzyme structure from the collaborators of the PDB data bank and then press a button to calculate the free energy profile with which then you can answer questions. Yeah, once you have the position state barrier, you can you know something about the efficiency of the reaction, the rate of the reaction. You can then start looking at the effect of the protein environment and maybe even tell your collaborators or maybe even yourself creating a mutant that has a higher performance and then publish a paper. And in particular, when you're at the beginning of your PhD, getting these papers published is important because it will give you the PhD. So I understand that that is what people want. And I fully understand, and I fully agree that that is what you would want. But what you get in practice is something else. What you get is that you're ending up with an incomplete structure. So if you collaborate and these structures are kind of super duper fresh, yeah, they were just refined yesterday, there might be a lot of missing residues. You have to fix that first. Now, the workshop is not about that. But even more important is the protons, and in particular in the active side, which is where the chemistry, where the chemical transformation occurs, where you really need that QM. Um, where do you put the protons? So in general, in order to stabilize the transition state of a chemical react in a chemical reaction process, these uh, catalytic sites are, are heavily strained. They are in kind of quite unhappy, I would like to say, conformations. And that is not a problem because the protein is very big, the enzyme is very big, so you can compensate for these unfavorable interactions in the active site by folding a very large piece of proteins along with it and overall still have a folded, folded enzyme. But because of the strain in the active site and because of the unfavorable interactions, PKAs, the proton affinities of residues, may be quite different than you would expect them to be at the surface of the protein or in, in solution. And because a residue can be protonated or not, you have two possibilities and you don't always know what to do. And if there is many residues where you have to choose the protons, you end up with a combinatorial problem. So already preparing the structure for a simulation, you need, you need to do a lot of thinking and a lot of wishful thinking perhaps as well. Then you need to equilibrate it, but that's not all. I mean, once you have the structure, you need to have a force fields and enzymes. So while we have good force fields, well, good, you can argue about that, that's not a topic of this workshop, but while we have force fields for proteins to describe amino acids and, and, and nucleic acids and, and water, typical biological stuff, membranes, enzymes often contain cofactors and cofactors are not common enough that they have been parameterized by default. So if you're taking a force field, maybe the cofactor that you need in your enzyme or the substrate is simply missing. That means you have to parameterize it and that is also a task on its own. 
subsequently, after you have been able to generate a good model, equilibrate it, and, and have done whatever is needed to prepare input for QMM, you need to decide what is going to be your QM size, which atoms are going to be part of the QM region, which atoms are not going to be part of the QM region. And if you have done that, with whatever argument you can come up with, you need to choose the level of QM to you. Again, a lot of choices, a whole forest of choices out there. And then you're still not done because an unbiased MD simulation of an enzyme reaction, well, these enzyme reactions to get to the transition state is typically takes a long time. Now, it's not the kind of time scales you can cover in a normal MD simulation, in particular not when you do a QMM calculation, taking into account that the QM calculation is 1,000 to 10,000 times more expensive or even worse. That means you have to bias your run. And biasing the run means that you sample according along some predefined coordinates. Now, these predefined coordinates require a lot of understanding of the chemistry yeah, to know where is the reaction going to happen, which bonds are going to break, which bonds are going to form. And yeah, if you talk to an organic chemist, a synthetic chemist, you sh they, they can tell you by looking at the structure, by looking at the two-dimensional picture of the structure, they can tell you, oh, if you add now uh, whatever, a water molecule, it will react there. They know what are the reactive modes because of experience, because, of, because they're very smart, I don't know. But for me, being a bit more physical chemist, I don't know that a priori. So for me, choosing a reaction coordinate is, 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 is highly non-trivial. And then you have to decide whether you want to have potential energy servers, or if you think if entropy plays a role, you need maybe computer-free energy servers, so you have to change maybe the method that you want to use. And then, as I said before, you want to know the whole of the protein environment. Well, then you have to do something numerical, something that gives numbers. So you have to do some energy decomposition. And finally, you get your paper rejected because the reviewers want further re uh, validation. So this is a little bit the, the contrast we have between what you want and what you get. And maybe we can help you a little bit with what you get to make it closer to what you want. That would be nice if the workshop can somehow make one step in that direction. Now, um, for my group, as I'm already uh, introduced, is we develop QMM methods. And the reason why we do that is that I'm interested in photobiology. And now, this is a webinar and a funding application, so I don't have to motivate why photobiology is so important. I just find it interesting. And what photobiology is, is, is how biological systems, proteins, interact with light, for example. Yeah? They absorb light, and as a consequence, they do something with that energy. And a little illustration of a, of a, of a switchable fluorescent protein, which can switch between an on and off state, where the on state is fluorescent, nicely illustrates this. This was actually a copper picture for some paper we did some years ago. So the photon comes in and changes the conformation of chromophore, which is a molecule that can absorb light and do something with it. It goes from an on to an off state. Now to describe it, such a protein, it's a large system. So that already says, well, it can never treat the full system at quantum mechanics level, so we need some QMM for that. Electronic excited states have to be described because the process starts by absorbing a photon. Now, if a photon is coming by, and this is illustrated here, uh, in the ground state, well, I think most of you, if not all, are familiar with molecular orbital theory, where we nicely pair up all the available molecular orbitals with spin-paired electrons. Then if a photon is absorbed, then the energy of the photon is actually benefiting the kinetic energy of the electrons, so the electrons get a higher kinetic energy, and as a consequence, yeah, the electron has to occupy a higher energy level. However, the picture is too simplistic, because there is many combinations of excitations I can do, all fitting in the same energy band. So what I need instead is to take into account a linear superposition. I mean, all of them coupled. You need to take all of them into account in this molecular optical picture in order to get a well-described excited state. To get an excited state well-described. Sorry, to get a well, well, good model for the excited state. So you can already see that in addition to calculating just the ground state, you need to calculate a whole bunch of states. And for that, we use methods which are called multi-configurational. So they take into account multi-configuration of the electrons. And one of these methods is complete active space SCF, so CAS SCF. Now, the rule of the thumb in, in computational chemistry is that the more the longer the acronym, the more letters the acronym contains, the more accurate it is. And this is only six, so it's not so accurate. But it provides you with a consistent description of excited states and ground states, but it is a lot more expensive than, say, your ordinary Hartree-Fock or your ordinary D3-Lib ground state calculation. It scales very unfavorable with the number of atoms. In addition, nowadays, fortunately, time-dependent DFT for certain systems is becoming accurate enough so uh, a colleague of mine, Andreas De Hoek, always says that DFT is a very promising method because it promises so much, and I fully subscribe to that. But it, things are improving. And if you know what you if, if, if you know the system well and you can compare this to higher level of theory, DFT becomes an option. So there are two approaches to describe the, the excited state. But then these photochemical reactions, they start by absorbing a photon. 
the photon, because it changes the electronic configuration, it of course changes the forces that the nuclei experience, or in other words, in the born Oppenheimer picture, it changes the potential energy landscape of the nuclei. And that is illustrated in this plot here, where we have a ground state surface, where we have typical reaction like trans to cis, an isomerization of the double bond, like the one that takes place in this little, little protein. And then the excited state, well, excited state surface is different because the electronic configuration is not the same, and this is illustrated by the red surface. Now, molecules get promoted with the excited state surface, and then they start moving, and reality will be a wave packet, in our work it would be a trajectory, until there is a point where the two potential energy surfaces are very close in energy, and there you have what we call non adiabatic effects. It is where born Oppenheimer actually breaks down. And in order to compensate that breakdown of the born Oppenheimer and still continue running a classical trajectory, we're using techniques called surface hopping. And as the name suggests, you can just jump from one surface to the other whenever the quantum mechanical probability tells you to do so. I'm not going to talk about these things in detail, in any detail at all. It is just a couple of caveats or a couple of additional things you need to take into account if you want to use QMMM for photobiology. All of this thing is just implemented into Chromex, so one can use it out of the box. An example, huh? always nice to show movies, and this is a okay, quite old work, but the movie is still nice. Here we have a piece of DNA, and we have a two timing uh, bases in there, and if this absorbs UV light, we can actually do dynamics and see what happens. So we start now in a purple excited state, now UV light has been absorbed, and we see that, in a movie at least, we see that in a while we fall back to the ground state, and while doing so, we form new chemical bonds. We form the so-called DNA lesion. So at this point, we have a stable ground state product where the two timings have covalently become attached. Now, this might have uh, implications for the DNA replication or for the DNA transcription. And just an example that with MD, you can actually follow this type of processes. But the example I want to talk about in this, in this talk is about photoisomerization of biological chromophores. And isomerization means we go from trans to cis. So we have a double bond which goes from one configuration to the other configuration with the help of light. So here, the system that I've been working on since my PhD, so that's a long time ago, um, and I think we're still sometimes working on it. Uh, this is the photoactive yellow protein. And it is a blue receptor, it's kind of the eye between quotation mark of the bacterium. And this is the depiction I usually show when I talk to physicists, which is what I do most of the time, and they don't really, they don't have so much with this kind of representation, but I think this audience has. Um, in this representation, you can nicely see the chromophore exposed. This is the chromophore, so it's the molecule that absorbs light. And when we started this many years ago, we already knew that this protein absorbs blue light and changes its conformation. So it goes from an inactive to an active conformation, activating some other signal protein in the cell. And we still don't know which the other signal protein is, but nevertheless, we know how this protein works very well because of all the experiments that have been carried out. But the first step everybody agreed on when I started working on this many, many years ago is that there is an isomerization of the double bond that is pointed here with my arrow of this chromophore when light is absorbed. And that is what we wanted to know. So at the time we started this, there were no intermediate structures, at least no reliable one. So we didn't know what immediately after photo excitation the structure of the chromophore would look like. Or if you compare this to chromophores without protein, what the effect of the protein environment is in order to control this process. Did it control the process at all? So what we did at the time is we did the QMMM simulation. So we used the miscast CF method to be able to describe, describe excited states. And this is a very oops, low level uh, of theory. And now that we talk about best practices, well, what I'm converging to in terms of best practices is that you validate very carefully the, the, the QM method, for example. It is not something I did then, but of course this was 15 years ago. But the standards were a little bit lower at that time, in my opinion. So nowadays, I think if I had to reverie my own work, I would have probably insisted on a little bit more validation of the level of theory used, but that was not a problem then. So we got away with it. So what we did is we used Cassis here for the chromophore alone, but also a very small subsystem, which is hydrogen bonded. So we basically hydrogen bonded directly to an MM subsystem, which we described as chromos. Nah, I don't want to say anything about that. Um, and we used it at the something. And with that simulation model, um, we could actually follow quite nicely the isomerization process. So if we excite the system, now it's an excited state, we see very fast on a femtosecond time scale a rotation here, followed by on a slower time scale, the breakup of this hydrogen bond. And in the end, we get a stable configuration where the common floor is clearly in a so-called cis conformation, where this bond is cis and the oxygen is there. Of course, at the time, without any backup from time-resolved crystallography or from, from cryo-trapped crystallography, 
this was met with skepticism yeah, by the community that does theory because it is very low level of theory and by the experimentalist because yeah it's just a model right so it was a bit um yeah i was proud of it but like of always you're the only one who believes your own work and nobody else believes it. but that's how it is sometimes nevertheless over the years more and more evidence accumulated that this kind of hydrogen break is indeed an important process of the entry of the photocycle that these hydrogen bonds stay intact so overall there was more and more indirect evidence that this was not not so far off the reactor to validate that which we did a posteriori to validate that we have repeated the calculation so basically every time when the computers become better when the algorithms become better we repeat the calculations and the latest repetition we did was using a much larger active space so these numbers i haven't talked about basically means the number of electrons that you correlate in the number of orbitals so cast 12 11 means that all the pi orbitals of the chromophore are now correlated with each other are now described collectively with 12 electrons so you get a better description of the excited state um, we used a better basis set and we used uh, uh, the Amaro 3 force field. And this, by the way, is possible thanks to Alex Kranowski, who unfortunately is no longer among us, but he succeeded in making this expensive CASA-CF method scale extremely well on parallel computers. So that allowed us, that allowed Dimitri, oh, I thought he was here, but he's not, uh, to perform the MD simulation again. And, ah, yeah, there it is. Um, to perform the simulation again, and the result is fortunately the same. Uh, good. Then to validate this, by that was that is the best we can do at the moment. Well, there is something else we can do, but I don't think it's better. Uh, that is the best we could do at the time to validate this. So at higher levels of theory, we still can repeat the same simulation. We can also use nowadays, fortunately, we can also try to use experiment to validate this. And the experiment that I'm referring to here is a, is a time-resolved crystallography using femtosecond X-ray pulses. Now, that type of experiment you don't typically do in your own lab. No, instead, you go to Stanford. At least we went to Stanford. Nowadays, you can go to more places. And you use a free electron laser, which is a machine or piece of equipment that basically allows you to, 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 to probe structure with femtosecond X-ray pulses. The place itself, LCLS uh, in Stanford, is, is, well, you enter the experimental CXI hole from this little door here, and you can under the ground, and this is basically the experimental setup. This is the end station of this accelerator, which I will show in the next picture, and everything happens in this chamber here. It is a vacuum chamber where you jet your sample in, and here it interacts with the X-ray laser. This is the rest of the machine. So it starts kilometers upstream, where electrons are accelerated by the electric field, the electrons enter a undulator, and then the undulator, that is where actually the X-rays are generated. And then these X-ray pulses enter in the experimental hole where we perform our experiment. Now, very briefly, for those of you who are not familiar yet with this technique, a free electron laser, so the accelerator depicted here, spits out electron bunches of electrons that are accelerated to almost light speed. So you have to take into account the relativistic effects. These electrons enter the undulator, and the undulator is, is what is shown here. It's just magnets, which are paired and which are then alternated so north south south north north south south north. Um, like that and as you maybe recall from your physics classes whenever a charge is moving as a velocity in a magnetic field and then there was these things with the right hand rule where you have the velocity i think here the magnetic field here there is a force in this direction or maybe it was one of the other three things i don't know but there is a force and that causes an acceleration but because the magnetic field changes polarity all the time you basically start all electrons start undergoing the sinusoidal motion when an electron is accelerated, like here, the electron makes its own electromagnetic field. That means that the electrons are not only feeling the influence of the magnets, but also the influence of their neighbor, of their friend electron, a little bit well, close by. And as a consequence, in this equation somebody has solved a long time ago, as a consequence, fast electrons get slowed down, slower electrons get uh, accelerated, so that eventually all these electrons start moving in slices precisely a certain fixed distance apart where the distance is controlled by the speed of the electrons and the distance between the magnets. And now what you get is you get coherent emission. So all the light is now, of all this radiation is now emitted in phase. If you take into account the fact that the electrons move at almost light speed, um, that means that there is a contraction of the, uh, so the electrons don't see these magnets like centimeters apart like we would, but they see them much shorter apart. And at the same time, we are standing here, so there's also the Doppler effect. So what we see is we see that this radiation is coming at us, these pulses are coming at us at, uh, with, free, with, with wavelengths in the order of an angstrom. And because of that, we can use them for doing X-ray crystallography. Now, because you put so many electrons in this accelerator, 
your X-rays are actually very intense. So you get in the order of 10 to the power 12 to 10 to the power 14, photo, I think 10 to the power 12 photons per shot. So in a few femtoseconds, you shoot 10 to the power 12 photons at your crystals. This is enough to get the diffraction pattern, or at least a partial diffraction pattern. So instead of exposing a crystal for ages at the synchrotron, you can now use one or two, one pulse, and then get the diffraction pattern from that. Now, of course, because most of the uh, interaction with the X-ray is actually leading to inelastic scattering, maybe uh, stripping of electrons, your sample charges up and explodes. So that is why this technique is called diffract and destroy. The way it works is, at least in our experiment that we did five years ago, we have a liquid jet with protein crystals in there. These are nanocrystals or microcrystals. They are jetted into the gas, into the, into the, as a, in a stream into the, into the vacuum chamber where they interact with the X-ray pulse. The X-ray pulses hit these little crystals, and each crystal gives a diffraction pattern. And because the crystals are randomly oriented, you basically get all the parts of the Ewald sphere covered. And you just keep on collecting snapshots. You have to sort them and index them, put them all together to get the full diffraction pattern. Of course, all your proteins are destroyed, but that doesn't matter. You get the diffraction pattern. And what is nice is that because this is a pulse technique, so you have pulses of X-ray radiation, you can combine this in a pump probe scheme. So you can pump with an optical laser, in the case of photoelectric protein, which is tuned to induce the photoisomerization. And then you can wait with a certain time delay. I'm not going to talk about how that works, but it's relatively simple, but okay. You can, uh, well, it's not simple, but the idea is very simple. In practice, it's very hard, but the idea is simple. You can delay the arrival time of your optical laser that pumps, that starts, to, that initiates the reaction with the probe laser, in this case, the X-ray pulses, that then cause the diffraction pattern. And this way you can record the diffraction pattern as a function of time since photo excitation with the blue light. And this is very similar to normal pump probe spectroscopy that you do in your own lab. Um, but now use X-ray crystallography, uh, sorry, X-rays, X-ray pulses, 50 frames per second X-ray pulses to, to record the response of the system to this initial photo excitation. Now what you get in the final results after a lot of steps is that you can look at how does the electron density in the protein change in response to, to the photon absorption at time zero as a function of time. Now here's many snapshots, it's also very low resolution. So let's take out just three of them at different time points that is shown here again from two sides, from, from the top or whatever the top is, and from uh, the side, whatever the side is. Yeah? And the way it works, is what I've, what I've shown here is basically you take the ground state structure, the resting state structure, for which we already had an X-ray structure obtained at synchrotrons that is shown in yellow. And then what, I, then what we then do is we take the, the, the structure factors that we measure with certain time delays, extrapolate them to full occupancy, and then Fourier transforms them back with the phases of the original dark state. And what you then get is basically the electron differences in response to photon absorption. So red means that this electron density has disappeared with respect to the resting state. Blue means electron density has appeared. And because the electron density is carried by the atoms, this can only mean that atoms have, me have, have undergone displacement. You can then extrapolate this, this difference densities to full densities. That's also a bit fuzzy and, and a bit complicated, but you can do that. And then you can even refine. So what we do here in pink is the excited state and in green is the ground state because we know that somewhere between these two time points, there is the excited state K that we know from standard spectroscopy experiments. Um, and then we can refine these structures. And then basically what we're showing then is the refined structures and how we, based on the measured electron difference densities as a function of time since the photo excitation, how we interpret the signal by the following structural changes of the common form. This is something we can now compare. Now I showed you the movie of the isomerization process. We can take snapshots from the movie and we can this compare this one to one. So here, for completeness, we also show the yellow structure of the resting state to show the differences, and we use the same colors. And what you can see, what is important here, is that the main structural change, the conformational change of the chromophore going from trans to cis, that conformational change is perfectly captured, in my opinion at least, you can disagree, perfectly captured by the MD simulation. And keep also in mind that this is still an ensemble measurement, so there's many molecules excited at the same time, whereas this is just a single trajectory. So we still have a little bit of a mismatch in the order of 10 to the power, I, would, I estimated around 9 to 10 uh, in, in, in numbers, but the main, the, what is the chemical, so the driving force is causing this isomerization to happen exactly as it is happening in our experiment. So this was a nice, uh, I don't know, this gave us some confidence in the trajectory. I mean, it did not, it does not, it does not speak against the model that we have proposed. 
You can also take other X-ray structures, which were all obtained after the MD simulation, but uh, still these are previous in the, with respect to our own uh, crystallography study. And what you can see now also here is that we kind of capture the displacements in the chromophore backbone quite nicely in the MD simulations. So all of this, of course, does not mean that our model is right, but it does not say the model is wrong either. So we take it as a positive, we take it from the positive side and we say, we can conclude that at least for this photocellular protein, QMMM MD does a decent job. But it also does a decent job for other systems between us, I don't know. Of course, when I write the grant application, I say, yes, fantastic, we have validated everything that we do. Uh, it probably depends on a on a case to case basis, but in this case you get away with the model that we have here. Now there is one caveat or one not a problem but one issue, and that issue is that in addition to uh, uh, the wild type protein, uh, a lot of experiments have been done on mutants. For example, this mutant where the arginine is replaced to a, a glutamine. But I'm not going to talk about much detail here. In water and in vacuum, and in water, several several analogs have been they've been studied. In MD simulations, which is what these papers refer to because it is about the QMMM, we actually see that in addition to the double bond pathway, there is also the single bond pathway, which means that we have a rotation around this bond. So this is shown in this, these two movies. So this is the double bond in water, happens just like in protein, we have rotation here. But look at this, we have a rotation around the single bond. I call this isomerization between quotation marks because uh, it is not a real isomerization. We don't get the different photocorrects. But we see that most of the reactivity involves this process and not this process. And this is something that my colleagues who have worked a lot on this photoactive yellow protein never wanted to believe. They always question the validity of the single bond and that gets a little bit frustrating. Um, it's very consistent, so it doesn't matter what level of theory we use, even if we throw in a completely polarizable water model, we always get uh, this as a main channel, this single bond isomerization. So that was still something that could be an artifact of the method. So how do you proceed? Now, one way to convince my colleagues, my, my uh, interest in the same protein, uh, is that we can very accurately compute spectra that we can, for example, show here. Suggest oh, this may not look too good. The dotted line may not fit very well the absorption, but this is only a few nanometer difference. So this is pretty good, in my opinion. But still, that is not telling you anything about the dynamics. It just means that the ground state is sampled quite accurately. What about the excited state? The other thing we can do is we can try to recompute stationary points at different levels of theory. So we can calculate transition states for isomerization around this one and around this bond at, a, at the level of theory we use in the MD, and then compare that to a higher level theory that other that our theoretical chemists or computational chemists colleague agree agree on. Well, boring table and a very uh, unsettling result in a way because what we actually what i'm showing here is that depending on how many electrons you include in your active space or what basis set you use and this is just a selection things change quite a lot i mean we change the barrier quite a bit the only thing which is consistent is that we always find no matter what level of theory we apply we always find that the barrier for single bond isomerization is lower than that for the double bond isomerization so that is consistent so we have a qualitative consistency among the different levels of theory but the competing in the, in the experiment you would find both at least that's what we what we uh, what we conclude based on our simulation so we suggest that there is both isomerization channels but the barrier height will of course be critical for the brand sim. so the quantum yield you find at the end of the day will depend critically on these barriers and there is no hope at least in my opinion maybe you disagree but there is no hope of getting the branching branching ratio correct here so we need something else so what we then thought of and that is actually a bit simple, uh, but I still think it's fine. Um, how do we now prove that this is possible? Now, what we could think of is, why don't we try to lock this thing? This has been done a lot in the past. It is still being done a lot. You just lock one of the bonds so that it can no longer isomerize, in this case, the five ring prevent isomerization here, so that the only remaining channel is this one. So what we did is we created, we synthesized this chromophore and performed transient absorption spectroscopy on that chromophore. But first, we did again a desimulation to show that nothing is changing. And here, well, simulation is running, we excited. And while I'm talking, uh, this thing will start isomerizing around that bond, just as we predicted and just as it would if there were no lock. And 
again, of course, we knew this already that the simulation would do it. This was just a simul these, these simulations were only done to make sure that we do not change the electronic structure too much by adding this, this, this covalent lock. Then here are the results of our experiments. Now, what we say is that if you excite this system, you get an ultra fast picosecond dynamics of this isomerization process, and this brings back the molecule to the ground state. But the blue blob here in this different spectrum, so here we have the wavelength, and here we plot the time, and here, and this is basically how much signal we measure. Negative means that molecules are missing. So we excite the time zero, and then we measure how does the absorption of the sample change. And negative signal basically means such a different spectra that something is missing. That is logical because we have promoted some of the molecules to the excited state. However, over time, we see that this uh, bump in the, in the 2D spectrum is disappearing and it is gone away. That means that at this point, the molecules are all happily back in the ground state and can be excited again. And that is why the different spectra with respect to the normal absorption is become zero has spread out. And on the, on the basis of this behavior, we have concluded, we can only conclude that the dynamics after photo excitation of this molecule is over within a few picoseconds. And that is totally consistent with the single bond. So we think that now we have been able to prove or at least provide strong evidence that the single bond isomerization is possible. However, as I write here, experiments always require interpretation. We interpret this data with this in our minds. So there is always a huge risk of circular reasoning here. We don't really know. And the other advantage is this advantage is an experiment is, is more expensive than a computation. And the purpose, of course, is that eventually we would like to be able to predict an experiment so that we no longer have to carry out the experiment. And that is why using an experiment to validate what you've just been simulating is maybe not always the best solution. Okay, we stay a little bit with photoactive developed protein. And it is one controversy that was raised in 2009 when the neutron diffraction study came out. And the neutron diffraction study is able to see the positions of the deutron, of the protons, well, of the deutron, because they have a higher cross section. And what the authors of that work concluded was that the proton is sitting exactly in the middle. It is not here, it is not there. This is a hydrogen bond, very important one, but the proton is shared. So there's a long distance, like 1.2 and 1.2 here. And that was strange. Now, this is what the literature people call low barrier hydrogen bonds, and they have been implicated in chemical reactivity. It's a huge debate going on if they are real and if they are real, are they important? So this paper came out as the first experimental evidence because of the, of the neutron diffraction, able to be able to spot these protons as the first experimental evidence of a low barrier hydrogen bond. And of all proteins, it happens in my favorite proteins. So that was interesting. We would like to see because we didn't because in our model, of course, there is no short, there is no such hydrogen bond. We're just using uh, the proton is here. It's not here. It's just there. So that was a bit of a, something of concern because do we model the dynamics correctly if we cannot model this correctly? So what we then did is is we computed QMM potential energy surfaces for the proton or for the deuteron uh, for all these positions here. And this is an example of the potential. We use various TFT methods, and we use the force fields for everything which is not shown as uh, sticks. We use the force uh, as tick sticks. We use the force fields under row three. And this way, we then can compute potential surfaces. And with these potential surfaces, we can then solve the Schrodinger equation for the nuclei in order to get the wave function of that proton or of the deuteron. The only thing then is that you change the mass here. And the reason for doing this was that we wanted to see does this short hydrogen bond, does, is the theory support? Is theory able to predict or to reproduce, in this case, the, the, the position of the hydrogen atom? And with that, can we maybe provide insight into why is there this hydrogen bond in the middle? Why is this proton in the middle? And why is it not a normal hydrogen bond? So what we did, in contrast to what is still customary in QLMM, is we don't take the single protein from the unit cell and put it in a vacuum, which is unfortunately common practice. Instead, we try to model the experiment as closely as we could. So we try to build a model in which we take into account the fact that the protein exists as a crystal. So we put, we take the unit cells, uh, we fill these unit cells up with, uh, with proteins, so six per unit cell, and then fill it up with water and ions, equilibrate it, a lot of work, but in the end, we get a crystal. And then in the crystal, we can then perform these QMM calculations for the proton position. So we calculate the potential and we, we calculate the potential energy services for these protons and then perform uh, calculate and then solve the certain equation for the proton. Uh, uh, sorry, for the two one. Here are the results. It's a big table, and I'm only gonna go very quickly through it. So here we have tried different functionals. And this is the structure, the, deuteron, the neutron diffraction study in a vacuum. So that means you take one protein and you put it in a vacuum, you forget about the fact it's a crystal, the total protein is plus six charge. 
and then you calculate this potential. And only if we take this functionals, can be flip, then we get a significant extension of the hydrogen bonds. In addition, we have to assume that hydrogen is deprotonated, which is also, we also show that this is a wrong assumption, but nevertheless, only one model is able to describe this extension. So only one functional in combination with a questionable representation of the protein gives you an indication that this hydrogen bond is a such a low barrier hydrogen bond. Now that was also concluded by, 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 by other people, yeah, in particular the group from Barcelona concluded the same thing and they discussed it in this paper. However, this can mean a couple of things. This can mean that indeed vacuum models are good enough to represent a crystal and can be lip is a very good functional even if it was only made for excited states. Because we have done a crystal model and we have tried all other functionals, we are much more conservative in our conclusion. So we say, actually, the QM models, they scatter too much. There is no support, direct support for this low barrier hydrogen bond. So there is two opposing views. So I think there is no evidence uh, based on, on what we have calculated here. But again, best practices would mean, in my opinion, that you try as many methods as you can, validate these methods, and then see if the trend is consistently observed. So unless you have a good reason to dismiss a certain functional or a certain basis set, uh, if you can show that over a whole range of, of functions there is still the effect, then I'd start believing the effect is true. If the effect is only there in a specific combination of parameters, it might be an artifact. I'm not saying it is an artifact, it might be an artifact. But why? Why is there this discrepancy? To solve that question, we, 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 we got back to Yamaguchi and co-workers and, and they shared with us their, 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 their structure factors for the neutron diffraction experiment. And we made ourselves the refinement and we made ourselves the F omit, the, the F observed minus F calculated difference maps. And what you can see, so if you put the proton very close to the glutamic acid, yeah, then you see a huge difference. So basically this should give no signal at all if the positions are right. If the positions are wrong, this should lead to features like we see here. And what we see in the, in the lower bottom is that for a lot of distances of the proton, the experimentally measured structure factors fit the model. So based on our, conclu our conclusion says that actually there is no reason to favor this position over that position. Of course, this is easier to publish perhaps because this is something remarkable, this is something boring. But according to us, the experimental data does not allow you to conclude this over that. And this would be good because this is consistent with all the DFT methods that we have tried. Then finally, in the last few minutes, uh, enzyme catalysis, because I suppose that most of the people who are looking at QMM as a method in the field, uh, uh, for the field of study, are interested in some enzyme, which is catalyzing a reaction. And a very important reaction is nucleotide hydrolysis, a nucleotide triphosphate hydrolysis. So for example, ATP, which is the energy carrier in our cells, when you hydrolyze that, it releases quite a lot of energy and you get this ADP with two phosphates and this, uh, this number pyrophosphate, I don't really know what this is called, but it is something with phosphate and, and protons. The, intra the system we worked on is a system that my colleague, Lars Schaefer from Bochum is interested in. Uh, it's an ABC transporter, shown here. What these transporters do is they, well, there is a cup, a, a lid kind of thing, which is, binding uh, a substrate, a molecule that needs to be transported. It can bind to the transmembrane part on one side and release whatever it has found, the molecule, the substrate that needs to be transported into this channel. And this channel can open and close uh, thanks to phosphate, uh, sorry, ATP binding and reaction over here. So here's a dimer, there's two sides here and the hypothesis, or not the hypothesis, but we know this is a molecular machine which opens and closes, which changes this, this part depending on, and it depends on ATP. And the ATP goes in, gets hydrolyzed into ADP, and, and that is somehow how it works. And the question last had, and, and we wanted to answer it with Martin Fries and, and Hendrik uh, Gerdeke, was, is that ATP hydrolysis in the active site, which is shown here, so here's part of the ATP, the magnesium ion, very typical for ATPases. Is the ATP hydrolysis, does that provide all the energy, does that provide the power stroke for this machine to open and close to let the substrate through? Now, this is a slow reaction, we knew that because it takes a, it's a, it's a few times per second. So we know that we cannot do this unbiased MD. I would just run an MD simulation and see what happens. Instead, we need to, we need to use a, 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 we need to enforce, we need to use bias simulation. So we need to calculate so-called free energy profiles or potentials of mean force. And the way we do that is we decide on the reaction coordinate R. In this case, it is the distance between this attacking water molecule, the nucleophilic water molecule and the phosphate. Um, we, 
we constrain the distance, so we fix the distance and then simulate the system, and we change the, the we change the distance. So we run this for multiple different distances, and then we basically monitor the constraint force. So that is the force needed to keep this constraint true. Uh, we monitor that, we, we we store that over the trajectory, and then we calculate the ensemble average or the, the trajectory average for each of these positions, and then we integrate that force to get the free energy profile. We should correct the fixment term here, but I'm not going to talk about that because we ignored it because it is typically in the order of a kilocalorie per mole, and the error is bigger than that. So we ignore this part. But in principle, you should take them into account. Now, the reaction coordinates, of course, where the difficulty starts. And I'm going to actually give you an example of where we chose the wrong reaction coordinates. But fortunately, the reviewer pointed it out. Now, for the first step, there is no doubt. I mean, every chemist can tell you it must be this distance. So that's nice. Then we need to choose a QM region. We did two QM regions. Bigger one to check if the conclusions reached for the low, smaller one is valid. And it's basically all the residues which are shown here in stick representation, except for the adenine part of the of this RTP molecule. Then the level of theory. So this is where you have to do your homework. So you either have to validate the level of theory, in this case it's the DFT functional, this one over here, I don't even know what this all stood for, um, and the basis set. And this was nice because here we could rely on some work of one of our other speakers, Maria Ramos. Uh, who had performed the benchmark where they benchmarked 52 functionals for this hydrolysis of, uh, of, of, of phosphate. And we took the one that they concluded was the best one. We actually added something here. We added this D3 corrections by Grimme, get also dispersion described better. And uh, thanks to them again, they shared with us the input files for their study so that we could very quickly run the validation also for this, adding this D3 functionals and that, uh, this, D, this D3 corrections. And that is even better. I, I think it, uh, that was our conclusion. So now we have a good model. It has been validated, not by us, but like, you know, when you have to do homework, if your classmate does the homework and you can look what they have done, it also helps you. And this is also the whole purpose of publishing papers, right? You share your results so you don't have to redo the whole process. And for the force field, uh, we use Amber. This is the one of the David Shaw. I think it was the improvements of the David Shaw group. This is our model. And then we start doing this potential of mean force calculations. Um, so the first step of the process, we let this water molecule basically attack the phosphate and we see that while we drive this distance to smaller and smaller values, this bond breaks up and the proton around the transition state, which is this configuration, that proton of that water molecule has actually gone to the glutamic acid. So the glutamic acid here acts as the base during the, during the process. So that is nice and we get the free energy profile, which is very much in line in with many other ATP aces. So we have a transition state around 14 kilojoules per mole, kilocalorie per mole, sorry, I don't know why my colleague from Germany uses kilocalorie, I only noticed that now, uh, uh, 14 kilocalorie per mole uh, per year. Then the second, I only noticed that, not, I don't notice that now, I noticed that when I put this presentation together, but using kilocalories here. Then the second step. So what is important oops, to realize is that at this point, the proton is on the glutamic acid and in the starting configuration it was here. So the enzyme has not been regenerated. And we also know that we need two protons on this phosphate, on this leaving phosphate group. So then we have to think, so how does the proton go from this glutamic acid onto that moiety? And then the first try we thought, ah, well, in classical MD simulations of this state, we see water molecules going in and out. There is probably a water molecule at some point. Let's put a water molecule in some point because, as you can see here, the distance is way too large between here, between there, and between there. So we just assumed oh, there's probably a water molecule, and it made a lot of sense to us at the time. So we insert a second water molecule, and now assume that the proton transfer first goes to the water and then goes to the phosphate. So our reaction coordinates now this proton oxygen distance, which we then diminish over time, and we calculate the free energy of that process. And there is the process. So here's the proton. It moves towards the, towards the water molecule that is shown here. So we have a hydronium-like system where the glutamic acid is here, but it gives the proton to the phosphate. And indeed, we get this H2PO4 minus. And the water is restored, and the glutamic acid is restored again. So that looks good. And we try to publish that. We get a barrier which is really small, so we don't add anything to the rate limiting step, basically. We're very happy with that. But the problem is, as the reviewers pointed out, the problem is you need to add the free energy of the inserting water. Okay, no problem. Reviewers suggest something, we do something, and we found out that it is very high. The free energy of pulling in and recruiting that water is so high that the barrier would way to be would not be comparable anymore to the rate limiting step. Uh, it would make a way too slow rate limiting step. Okay, so this is wrong. So even after we submitted it, we realized, not realized, somebody told us this can't be. So we have to do something else because of course you don't want to give up. 
So what we then did instead is we looked for something else, an alternative pathway, and we found one, at least we could imagine one. Now we try to basically transfer the proton to dead oxygen, uh, sorry, to dead oxygen over there. It's a longer distance, and this oxygen is actually ligating magnesium, but let's try. This is the nice thing about simulation, you can try whatever you want. So the second reaction coordinate is now involved. It's now this proton transfer, and we drive the proton transfer, and while we do that, we indeed see that the, the, the coordination of the magnesium is broken, but the proton is transferred, and we have created this intermediate. The problem with this is that the product state of this intermediate, we call it ES2, intermediate state 2, the problem is that the energy is relatively high with respect to the ad hoc state that we started from. So what we then did is we argued that, well, probably there has to be some relaxation. So the next step, the third step, is the rotation of this phosphate moiety to restore, to rebuild this hydrogen, this, this, sorry, this ligating bond with the, with the magnesium. And that is shown here. So we rotate this phosphate, very small transition state, hardly worth mentioning. And then we have a new coordination bond over there. And as I said, hardly worth mentioning, it's really small. And then we gain a lot of free energy by going down into this final conformation. So based on these calculations, we conclude that the energy released or the free energy associated with this three-step ATP hydrolysis process of plus 1.8 kilocalorie per mole rules against or concludes against that the ATP hydrolysis is the power stroke. So we speculate that actually the ATP binding is causing the conformational changes of this protein and that the hydrolysis is needed to get the ATP out again, or in this case, the ADP plus the phosphate out of the active site again. And I chose this example not to discuss ABC transporters, um, even though Lars Schaefer's group published a paper this year where they look at the transportation process, so maybe the answer to the power stroke is in that, I just didn't bother to read it yet. Um, but the point of showing this work was that the reaction coordinate choices, choice is critical, and it is very easy to make a mistake there. Or maybe it's not, maybe we're just stupid, I don't know, but we made a mistake. But the reviewer pointed it out, which is initially embarrassing, but finally nice, because at least now we have something that we can have more confidence in, even though still the a mark. Okay, I would like to end this now. So QM simulations, yes, they are powerful in the hand, uh, but there is a lot of challenges associated with them. And you have to think about these things before you even start to avoid disappointment and frustration. And, and, and one is the QM and the model, yeah, the level of theory, you need to validate that. QM region, that should also be validated. I don't know what is the current state of the art there, what is the current accepted practice, but hopefully it comes out during these webinars and during the panel discussion. The sampling method is also something that, that needs to be validated. I mean, why do you choose these reaction coordinates? Are there alternative reaction coordinates? And how do you how do you convince yourself, not even talk about others, how do you convince yourself that this is the sampling method that you need? And finally, I've briefly talked about validation, which I think is very important. Ideally, you would like to use an experiment, but these are indirect and you cannot always do an experiment. For example, for the ATPase reaction, what kind of experiment should I do? Make a mutant, but that changes a lot of things at the same time. So that's very difficult sometimes. Photochemistry, it is actually a lot easier, as you have hopefully seen, in this, as you have seen in this talk. And then you can also validate, which is what we have used most of the time, is that we try to calculate the same processes or recalculate points on a potential energy surface at a much better level of theory. But how reliable is that? When are you done? We don't know. Good. With that, I, those of you who still feel that they want to do QMMN, I wish you good luck with that. I hope you're gonna gonna, gonna find interesting results and, and promote this method uh, as as a as a good method, with the caveats that you need to be very careful with what you're doing. And then before I really end it, I have to acknowledge the funders, BioExcel, Finnish Academy, and most of the computations, no, all of the computations I think I discussed today were run at computers provided by Praise or by the CSC uh, uh, National Computing Center. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Gerrit. So we have already a couple of questions which mm -hmm. I will follow on with. So we have the first question uh, from Bagari, who said I can ask directly. His question is, what do you mean by validation of the level of theory? Now, you, this was a question earlier on, and you okay. um, highlight you, you already discussed this to some extent when you talked about benchmark uh, benchmarking on 52 functionals. So um, that, that was asked before that, but yes, that is the question. 
Okay, so if this question has not been answered, I can I can still still answer it, or maybe I can. So validation of the level of theory is indeed that that you show that the what you observe, let's say it's a barrier, let's say it's a process, let's say it's a position of a proton, that that uh, result does not critically depend on the level of theory. Yeah, it's very hard. So for up initial methods, like if you if you start at Hartley Fock, then you can do perturbation theory, or you can use a coupled cluster. We know what is we have we know what is the Jakob's ladder of the uh, of increasing the accuracy that you can expect. So there we know quite well how to improve a result. We may not always be able to do so, but we know quite well how the result can be improved. This is of course hopeless for DFT. Well, maybe I'm insulting some people now and picking up a fight. That is not my intention. But for DFT, there is no, in my opinion at least. And maybe I'm wrong, there's no way of systematically improving or choosing a better functional. So the only way to do it is to compare this to coupled cluster results and then checking which functional works for which system. So that is what I mean by validation. And in the work of Maria Ramos and others that I actually referred to much earlier in the talk, let's see, that was somewhere here. There, in that study, they had indeed taken a, st a standard hydrolysis reaction, both with water, and I believe, if I recall correctly, with OH minus, but is that hydroxyl? Um, and and compared the, the reaction barriers for all these functionals to the couple of cluster results. I hope I'm telling correctly what was in that paper. Um, but that is what I mean by, by validation, that you get confidence in the level of theory that what you see is not a lucky combination, like in the case of the Lowbury hydrogen bond, where there's only one specific combination of assumptions that is giving you the result that you want. That is what I mean by validation. Has this question now been answered? Is there a way to get feedback now from the asker? I think the asker could uh, well, could uh, could suggest uh, whether it's been answered or not um, in the chat. But I will move on to the next question. Meanwhile, the next question is um, uh, from Josip, and I will uh, read it out. Uh, the question is: Why did you use such a high level of theory as CASCF? Um, this is earlier on as well, uh, saying DFT or MP2 uh, is not good enough for this for this case. No. So the, the specific problem that we tried to address was what happens after photon absorption. So what happens in the so-called electronic excited state? So you're no longer in the ground state. I can, can people still see the slides? Yes. I don't know, yeah. So what I mean is, so after photon absorption, you're no longer in this configuration. And if you want to improve this configuration, of course, it is a molecular optical picture. It is a hardly fog picture. It is a mean field picture. The reality is different. If you now do perturbation theory or coupled cluster, you start also mixing in excited state configuration to the ground state. But assume in DFT you don't do that. So use this as a model because you have this, this, this mapping. Um, but now if light is absorbed, then you get into an excited state, electronic, uh, exci electronically excited state. And that is modeled by, for example, this one, or this one, or this one, or this one. And all these are close in energy. And in order to be able to get a decent or an accurate model of that excited state electronic structure, and with that, the excited state forces on the atom, on the atoms, you need to go to methods like cas -SCF. Now, DFT methods, linear response methods, are, be are also being used a lot, but there are a lot of issues with the density functionals that are being used for this kind of linear response calculation. So the, the theory is clear. It is the Rumen Gross, uh, uh, Gross theorem, which was done, I don't know, no, not Rumen, yeah, Rumen Gross, I believe. Uh, uh, they proved that, that you can indeed look at linear response to get the uh, excited state properties of a molecule, but the functionals are the problem. So it's very difficult to get to know if a function is going to give you a decent description of the excited state. Another problem is that once you get in this region where you have this non adiabatic coupling, that is something where DFT performs quite poorly because in principle, DFT is a single configurational method. And at this point, when there is two potential energy surfaces which are close together, two electronic states which are almost degenerate, it is intrinsically a multi-configurational problem. So you have multiple kind of occupations of the orbitals that you need to consider when you want to describe the electronic structure there. So that is why for photochemistry, we can't use DFT, we can't use MP2. You can improve the cas SCF result by adding perturbation. That is, for example, cas pp 2 or the XMCQ, CDT, C method, I have too many acronyms, uh, where you actually basically take this complete active space wave function to zero other wave function and you then perturb it to get a better, to get better energies. Okay, thanks. That sounds like a comprehensive answer. 
Josip, who asked this question, if you want to ask anything else to follow on from, please enter the question in the box, but I will follow on with other questions because there are a few more. Next question mm -hmm. from somebody who doesn't have audio, Batul, is can you discuss the problem of reproducibility with QMM simulation? Um, okay, so let me first uh, not rephrase the question, but let's just, so reproducibility meaning that if I repeat the simulation with exactly the same software on exactly the same architecture, with exactly the same initial conditions, do I get the same answer? And the answer is yes, I get the same answer. However, what we do actually in practice is that we run, we, we take in ground state ensemble. So we're performing MD simulations on the ground state, uh, to get an equilibrated ensemble, and we take snapshots from the ground state to next week to start the photochemistry. And what you then get is, of course, a distribution. So when we look at an excited state's trajectory, we do, for example, with the last paper, I think we did 200 or 100, I don't recall, it doesn't really matter, but it's a lot, in my opinion. We did 100 simulations, and each of these simulations starts from a different initial condition, using the same software, obviously, on the same architecture. And then you get a distribution of lifetime. So one trajectory already decays to the ground state at maybe 500 femtoseconds, the second one at 200 femtoseconds, the third one at 700 femtoseconds. So in the end, you can make a nice exponential decay plot that you can actually compare to experiments. And that comparison is not so good, but that doesn't matter. The, the, what matters is that you try to get a statistically converged answer here. And if you get it, I don't know. If we have convergence, no way of telling. But no, it is reproducible in the sense that each of these trajectories undergoes the same chemistry. But it's not exactly reproducible that every trajectory does exactly the same at the same point in time, because then it would be silly to calculate 100 trajectories if they were all the same. But when you talk okay. about reproducibility, if I now if, if I now share with you my input that I did 15 years ago and you run it again, you should get no, I know you will get similar results, but not exactly the same. That is because you, you will use a different computer. I mean the machine on which we run it on. It was one of these IBM SP2 or something. I don't even know what was the name of that one, but that, I think you can only find it in a museum. And I doubt that they will allow you to start it up to run a trajectory uh, to check if things are reproducible. So if you run it again, you get the same outcome, but you don't get exactly the same dynamics because it's a different architecture. The home expression is different. Perhaps also the quantum, and for sure, the quantum chemistry program will have upgraded in the meantime. Uh, that will always lead to some changes. Okay, thanks. Uh, Batul says thanks already in the in the questions. So, and then there are a few questions which are all uh, I very relevant. Questions. I don't see these questions. Is that okay? Ah, maybe it doesn't matter, but yeah. Uh, so there are a few different questions, all relating basically to what software did you use? Ah, oh, I didn't even mention that. Hmm, so far for reproducibility. So this was all done with Romax using the QM interface, and the QM interface was to various programs. So most of the work, let me, let me vary with, yeah, most of the time we use Gaussian for the QM calculations, with one exception. So this large active space with 12, uh, 11 electrons, so that was, I think, uh, one of these, these, uh, these studies over here, Dimitri, that was done with a program called Firefly, because that has this very efficient uh, CAS SCF implementation so that you could actually do this. But all the others were done with Gaussian, as far as I recall. Yes, I think so. Oh no, maybe this was done with. Maybe this was also done with Firefly. I'm not 100% certain. Of games. But anyway, but in general, always Chromax. And then maybe the quantum chemistry program is changing. Somebody asks, what about CP2K? So CP2K is something that, uh, that, that, that we have developed an interface for within the context of BioXL to integrate these two codes. That is available, but none of, the, wo none of the, the work I have been showing here was old work. It was not our latest work. So at the moment, Dimitri has, has, has developed that interface, and we are using it now in our work. And there will be, I think, I'm not sure how, if it was, is it, is it still on schedule, the webinar that we give about the CP2K, Chromax interface? Anna? Yeah, or we'll advertise that later. Okay, so there will be, Dimitri will give a talk about the capabilities of the new interface. So and the nice thing about that interface is that both of it is open source software, so that means there is no, because I know Gaussian has to be purchased, CP2K does not have to be purchased, so it means it's available for everybody. So we hope that it speeds up a little bit the uptake of QMM, but one has to keep in mind, uh, before you do QMM, you need to know, you need to think, you need to have decided already how you're going to do it. You cannot just, don't expect that if you download these two programs and you connect them together and you start running something, you get immediately answer. You need to 
do these uh, decisions before you do that. Okay, there's a question. For the enzyme catalysis example, uh, validation of the QM level of theory was mentioned with DFT, but was a comparison to semi-empirical methods such as empirical valence bond method considered? And if so, does the validation process change? Okay, so first of all, so if I rephrase the question, let me rephrase the question again. So have we validated the DFT against, against EVB? And the answer is no, because EVB is, itself, is in itself an approximation. So EVB is empirical valence bond. You parameterize that based on higher level QM methods or experimental data. So it's not, it's a semi-empirical, it's an empirical method. It's almost like a force field, which therefore should not be used to benchmark DFT functionals, for example. So the benchmark in this study was done by comparing it to coupled clusters, singles, doubles, and conservative triples using, I think, a CBS, but I'm not 100% sure what the basic set was there anymore. So that is the kind of the golden standard in quantum chemistry, and that is what you compare the functionals against. To see how well they do it and if you do an EVB model so if you want to make an EVB model for phosphate transfer which is also very well possible I think what I would do I don't know if, if others do that but I think what I would do is I would also parameterize the EVB parameters in particular the off diagonal elements and the diagonal elements I would also parameterize those on such data sets on such couple cluster data sets does that answer the question if it so again this is what, yeah Pardon who asked the question, please go ahead and, so and this, respond. This was, this was a personal, personal opinion. So this was not a best, a general best practice. I mean, parameterization is always a hard problem and people have their own preferences there. But this is how I would do it. I would use CC couple cluster to, to parameterize EVB models and not the other way around. Okay. Yeah. Then a uh, question, your last example, when you do the PMF calculations, is the whole protein allowed to move or do you freeze part of it? Okay, so everything is allowed to move, so there is nothing frozen, because of course once you start freezing coordinates, you need to also calculate the effect of freezing those coordinates, which you don't want to do. So in this case, these are completely free MD. The only constraint in the simulation is the distance between the two, uh, between in this case, as you can see my arrow, between this oxygen and that phosphate uh, and that phosphorus. Okay, um, in slide 67. Wow, somebody has kept track. Yes. Uh, how is the question is how is the or reorientation of the h2po4 group modeled Aha. i went a bit fast over that because i was looking at the time and i thought oh yeah it's very so late um we put a distance restraint distance uh constraint sorry between the o2 gamma this one over there and the proton uh, sorry and the magnesium so basically what we do we kind of want to re uh how you say re ligate the magnesium by pulling the oxygen two gamma towards the magnesium to form again this 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 bond. So that was the reaction coordinate here. That is what you see here: magnesium O2 gamma distance in angstrom, starting from a large distance to a low distance, where you have again a coordination. Okay. Uh, how many, somebody asks how much computational resources and time did the ABC transporter PMF simulations take? Yeah, a lot. Um, I remember we had a so-called uh, grand challenge proposal awarded for that to be able to use very large numbers of 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 of, of, of CPU hours. Uh, it was very expensive. That is the only thing I recall. I don't know exactly how expensive, but I, we can look that up. Maybe we even mentioned something about that in the in the in the paper, which is cited here. It was a lot. It was a lot more than we actually had. We had to ask for for even more resources because we had to do the second this last step again, uh, as you know, because the, this step here was done wrong. So we wasted actually a lot of CPU hours on on, on something wrong. But that's how it goes sometimes in science. Not every experiment is successful either. Okay. So sorry, no answer because I, I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> okay, thanks. Do you have time for any more questions, or shall we leave it here? I have time. I don't know about the participants. Okay. Well. It's being recorded, so anybody who cannot no longer see uh, mass time, they can look at the recording at the answer later yeah, as well. So what I say can be used against me. Hmm. <laughs> um, so another question is, um, did you use uh, electric, electronic embedding or mechanical oh, embedding? Very good question, because I haven't mentioned that. So all these works were done with, ah, so all works except one were done with so-called electronic embedding. That means that all the, Atoms in the in the MM subsystem that have a charge enter 
the one electron Hamiltonian of the uh, the one electron Hamiltonian of the current subsystem. It was not done in the case of PYP. In the case of uh, in the, uh, which one is it? We, we repeat repeated because here in this implementation does not allow for adding adding additional elements to the one electron integrals. So there we had to do so-called mechanic embedding or onion as it is called in Gaussian. Does that answer your question? I assume so. We'll hear back from the Ooh. questioner if it doesn't. Uh, there's one. Uh, thanks for the inspiring talk. In the example of ATPAs, do you yes. include do you include large time scale protein flexibility? Uh, maybe taking several configurations from an MM trajectory. This could make the the mm -hmm. active site thermally accessible to water molecules. Yeah, so that is a good, that is a very good question. So in this case, I think each PMF window was running a few picoseconds only, so no large conformational changes during the PMF calculation. The normals, so in addition to this QM MM simulations, we perform also normal kind of standard MD force field, uh, force, force field MD simulations. In those force field MD simulations, we have observed water entering in the adduct state, whereas the adduct state is not here. In this one, so water is entering uh, uh, the error state, as far as I recall. But we did not observe in simulations of this IS1. We do also observe water molecules going in, but not at the position required for this two water, for this two water, for, sorry, for this two water mechanism. And I recall that when Hendrik tried to pull in the water molecule there, it was a very high free energy barrier. So this is not something that would happen spontaneously. So we were a little bit. Uh, yeah, how to say, you got a little bit too enthusiastic about that idea. And the problem is, of course, what happens now is that, so this profile ends here at this intermediate state one. Then a water molecule comes in, which is, of course, changing the free energy somehow. And most likely, it brings it up quite a bit. And then at this point, so that is then the point high up, starts this profile. Yeah, starting too high here. That means that this point is not connected anymore to this point and that is the problem whereas in the other approach where we're simply introducing uh, where we just start from this intermediate state one and then see what happens to get intermediate state two of course these are directly connected so we can connect to both the energy profiles to get an overall barrier is that an answer to the question i hope it is and if not, then please, please, please. Yes, please there's, a thanks. there's a thanks for the answer. Um, and the thanks for some of the previous answers as well, because they, they address what their question is. Okay, welcome. Um, there's, there's another question, which is, um, what's your opinion about the use of polarizable force fields like Drude to be used together with functionals, including dispersion theory, D3, compared to others, for example, Charm 36? Mm -hmm. So the question is, if, so, so, is, is, so it's not, is it the question, is it, what is my experience in using the QM methods which incorporate this empirical dispersion corrections, let's say these Grimma D3 corrections, in combination with a force field that is polarizable? So what that I will do question. is I, I will I will let the person who asked the question, I will unmute uh, Yasser. Um, if you are able to uh, to speak, uh, then you can maybe clarify the question. Uh, so Yasser, I'm going to unmute you now. And if you don't speak, then um, We'll just let Gerrit answer anyway. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yes, my, my my question is basically because there is a, I have seen in the literature some uh, kind of a debate about the use mm -hmm. of root and, pol um, and polarizable force field because they do not add much uh, advantage uh, when uh, compared with Charm 36, for example, when it's used with functionals that already includes the polarization so my question okay. is basically what's what's your opinion about that because they there's some work that says that in order to do that you have to actually validate um Drude depending mm -hmm. of what a method a functional and basis set you used so and also Drude already is computationally more expensive than the the, the other mm -hmm. post period so okay. just a, a philosophical point of view. Yes, okay, okay, I see the point. Yeah, this is an interesting, this is an important discussion. So the question is basically coming down to 
do you need, would, it, would the results improve if you have a polarizer with force field over a standard force field? And this is a debate which is going on, and the reason why it's going on for a number of reasons is that, first of all, we, we know that the force fields have been parameterized not for doing QLM simulations. The, the, the pairwise potential that we use in all the force fields, it is just an approximation. We try to capture many body effects, which basically polarizability will cover, right? I mean, polarizability is a multi, many body effect. You try to, co to, to cover, to capture many body effects with a pairwise potential. And that means you have to make compromise on the value of the parameters, of the Van der Waals parameters, or sorry, of the Leonard Jones parameters, if you use the Leonard Jones model, and the partial charges of the atoms. So these partial charges often do not reflect the actual charge distribution that well. But they are a trade off in order to be able to build a good model. And then you parameterize that model or you train that model in machine learning language. You train that model on, on, on test set that can be free energies, it can be structure. Many different possibilities. This is, but these point charges have not been optimized, and Van der Waals parameters have not been optimized for work with QMM. So the moment that you then decide to check one part of the system and use a QM method, it's actually the fact that this works is 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 more amazing than that it doesn't work. Now, intuitively, if you would add polarizability and then do a QMM calculation with a polarizable M force field, I would expect the results to improve. And in fact, I did not talk about it, but when we do these calculations with a polarizable force field, EFP is a polarizable model of water. Um, we actually get very good results. Um, yeah, I, I have actually, I did not have slides on that anymore. For, for example, excitation energies. So that suggests that polarizability is very important for excited state properties. So we kind of know this, but it is also not really workable to use a polarizable falsehood at this point for QMMM. There's a lot of problems with that because you have to do SCF, so consistent. Because the nice thing about point charges, they don't change. So you convert your wave function, you find the, the lowest energy electronic wave function, and you're done. If you have a polarizable force field, then the moment you have your wave function converged, that will, of course, change the polarizability, the polarization, sorry, of the atoms around it. So you have to update the polarizability. Then, of course, you have to change the... the, the so you have to build a self-consistent field routine, which not only updates the electronic degrees of freedom, so the coefficients of the wave functions, but also the polarizability. So it's a very... It's a much more difficult thing to do. I'm not saying it's impossible. People do this. There are many groups who develop this. Jakob Kongstedt, uh, Benedetta Minucci. Many people are developing polarizable QMM models. But my experience with it is zero. The only one we have done is here. Dimitri has run this EFP, this effective fragment potential-based polarizable model uh, uh, in QM calculations. Now, to the questions of polarizability in the QM region. So if you add polarization functions to the QM region, in general, what can happen if you use point charges is uh, what is called the overpolarization problem. That if you have too much flexibility, so one, yeah, and again, it is a best practices uh, a workshop. So in my opinion and in my experience, using a bit more limited basis sets, so not too many basis functions, not too many, in particular, not adding polarization functions or not adding too many polarization functions or in particular diffuse functions, is something that I think you should not you should do when you do QMM. You should not include, say, diffuse functions because that will lead to too strong interaction with point charges. But it is a personal opinion. I have not seen a clear comparison where people look into properties that you can actually validate where you know the answer, how it changes when you start including diffuse functions or, polar, or more and more polarization functions or this dispersion correction. So bottom line, my experience here is relatively limited. Um, and from my, from what I know, others have done. The answer is out. The answer is still not answered. It is not clear if polarization with the currently available polarizable force field models improves the QMM results. So for certain things, it improves it. And of course, there is also publication bias here. If you're improving a result, you're going to get it much easier published than if you show that it works the opposite way. So it's difficult to judge this, in my opinion, from the literature alone. So this is still a philosophical, or no, yeah, not even philosophical. This is an important debate, uh, which I think has not even is not even close to becoming settled. So now I said a lot. Uh, are you happy with what I said? Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was very. Yeah. Uh, I was my myself thing. What have I been telling? You? Okay. Good. Very insightful. Thank you very much. Okay, we have a question from uh, Mohammed. I will let uh, Mohammed. I will unmute you uh, so you can ask the question yourself. Otherwise, I will read it out. Hello. 
Uh, well, first Hi. of all, uh, very nice talk. I, I really learned a lot from it. So I had a question about um, using CAMP3 um, LYP for the um, protonation and deprotonation. And um, well, it, it showed a good result, or this is what you are expecting experimentally, and this is why you decided that this is the best method uh, for the benchmarking in a specific. And uh, my question is, the rest of the methods are not doing well, and did you think that this might be an error? All and right, so you I understand your question, but I also realized that I failed to, to, be, to be clear, because your question actually is the opposite of what I was hoping to convey. So basically, what we have, so if you use Cambi in combination with the isolated protein, so you take the protein out of the crystal, you put it out there in a the vacuum, and then you do a QMM calculation with Cambi for the QM region, then you find this increased distance of the proton. Any other functional or any other model, even if you minimize this model in, in energy minimizer model, you lose this observation. It becomes a normal hydrogen bond again. On the basis of that, you can do two things. You can either conclude, I trust the neutron detection study, and I therefore conclude that everybody who tries to solve to, to model an environment, a crystal environment, a solved environment, with anything but can be trilip, does it completely wrong. This is the ultimate evidence that can be trilip in combination with a vacuum, the charged vacuum model is the ultimate chemistry model. That is one conclusion. The other conclusion that we draw is that based on the big scatter between different methods and based on the big scatter between different models, we can't conclude anything. That is, the most likely interpretation is that this is a normal hydrogen bond because only one specific combination of parameters, in this case model plus parameters, gives something that is somehow slightly in agreement with that experimental result. Now, if you take into consideration that on top of that, an X-ray diffraction, I'm oh, sorry, uh, any diffraction study, because what you measure in diffraction is, is, is you measure intensities in reciprocal space. You don't measure phases. You have to do some computational tricks in order to get the phases. So there is always a large, not a large, but there's always some issue there. And what we show here is that if we calculate the phases for models where we put the proton at the normal location, we actually get as good density map, uh, uh, sorry, we get as good representation of the structure factors as if we put the proton in the middle. So this basically means that for the same experimental data, the same experimental data, you can put the proton in many different positions and still get acceptable agreement with the experimental data. So there is no reason to favor this structure over this structure. So my conclusion here, our conclusion here, is also that the experimental data do not support an, this middle in the middle hydrogen bonds over a normal hydrogen bond. And I think if you have to choose, I don't know who is one of these quotes, right? I mean, if you have to choose between an extraordinary, like, how was it again? I forgot the quote, but there is no reason to favor this over that. And if this fits all the other data, including the NMR data, I haven't talked about that, but the chemical shift of this proton should change dramatically if it is like this or like that. But actually the chemical shift looks very normal in this protein. So all the experimental data that we have points towards this. The computational data, except one combination, points towards this. And the neutron diffraction data points towards this, 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 or this. Then I take this. So that is my personal opinion. And as you can see, if you now look through the literature, you find different conclusions based on different methods. So that is why we kind of refrain from the conclusion. We just say that there is no evidence from computation for such a low hydrogen bond, which doesn't mean it is not there, it can still be there. But it's just that with the data we have today, it is not possible to conclude that. Does that answer the question? So it's the other way around. I mean, we don't use this as evidence for cambi lib being the ultimate functional. Actually, far from that. I think based on this, I say cambi lib is probably not such a good functional for the ground state. That makes sense. Well, thanks so much. Okay. There's quite an interesting, uh, somewhat uh, general question from uh, from Varun. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Uh, my question is in regards to the enzyme system. Uh, from what I understood, you were saying that the remaining protein is not frozen outside of the active site or the QM region. And mm -hmm. 
if that's the case, from what I saw in a couple of the free energy profiles, how are the protein configurations reflected in this? Because I only saw that the bond distance was shown as the reaction coordinate. And yes. uh, so how are you taking that into account, uh, the solvent, or let's say the protein environment into the reaction coordinate? Uh, yeah, how is that taking place? So basically what you do is you, 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 you constrain the distance between, in this case, the oxygen and the, and the phosphorus, and you change and you vary the distance. So you do it, and now you run a few picoseconds of molecular dynamics, QMN molecular dynamics, then you, at the same time, at a different processor, you run a simulation with distance a little bit shorter, and at the same time, on another set of processes, but it's even shorter. So that in the end, after, after a couple of days, you have uh, 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 gathered a lot of picoseconds for each different distance. And with that information, you can perform this integration. During these MD simulations, where only this distance is frozen, everything else in the system, oh, you probably don't see my hands, uh, everything else in the system is just moving around like it normally does. And that is reflected in these arrow bars, for example, on the profile. So the water molecules, everything else was just moving around. Of course, uh, a previous question that was earlier asked is that conformational changes, like large changes in the conformation of the protein, they cannot be covered because you only have four picoseconds. Okay. Per window. Then for that, you would have to simulate maybe microseconds per, 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 per point in order to be able to model whatever conformation changes can happen. And even then, we don't know because these proteins typically have a whole hierarchy of time scales of relaxation time scales. Some things happen very fast, some things happen very slow. And it's difficult to cover all of that. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have uh, what what could potentially be uh, the final uh, final question from uh, from, from uh, Renata. Uh, you saw the pump up spectrum for the uh, PYP protein. Yeah. For the for the isomerization reaction, and uh, I was wondering to which extent do you use it? Like you you use it just to just to look. Okay, the bleaching signal is until. This number of sec, uh, this number of seconds, and that means that the process lasts this, like the, to this extent, to this like interval of time. Or you use it also to look, for example, at the different dynamics you can find. For example, if you have like the fingerprints of an isomerization process or another one, you know. Um, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yes, I understand. The question. So what we tried, so let me first go through this fingerprinting. So what we had, so SATO actually, we started out using infrared, using time resolved infrared, where we know that if a single bond is isomerizing in a solvent, which has a very high viscosity, and we did it in cyclohexane, uh, 16 carbons and an OH group, what is it called? Something on oath, whatever. It's a molecule, it's, it's an alcohol with very long alkane chains. It's very viscous, but the isomerization reaction still happens there. The plan was, or the hypothesis was, or the hope was, that this single bond isomerization channel would form an intermediate where it was 90 degree twisted, and that had a large effect, it had a lot of not a large, but it should have a measurable effect on the CO stress. And the CO stress is always easy to identify. So we tried to do time resolved infrared, try to point out that the CO stress is that we can see a fingerprint change indicating that we are halfway the single bond isomerization. Now that failed because signal to noise was way too poor. So that's we resorted to very standard time resolved, uh, time resolved spectroscopy where you just measure the changes in absorption after you initiate the chemical reaction. So this is not really fingerprinting because in the optical range, the spectra are way too broad because all the fingerprinting, all the vibrational fine structure is hidden under these bands. So instead, the only information that you can tell from this is the blue indicates that something is missing. So that means that you have, you have a whole test tube full of molecules, let's say 10 to the power 40 molecules, you may be exciting 10 to the power two or 10 to the power, maybe even 10 to the power five molecules, whatever, but you still have the majority of the molecules are not excited. So if you then, after some time, want to excite, want to, to, to use the same white light pulse again, you will see that some molecules are missing, so the total absorptivity has gone down. And that is what this blue reflects. So we see that molecules are no longer present in their ground states because they are now doing their photodynamics, they're doing the excited state dynamics. But we see that after some time, we no longer we see white. That means that the absorption spectrum way before, let's say at time minus 10, is the same as the absorption spectrum as, as now.
And that means that molecules are basically, the whole system is basically back to where it was. And that can only happen if the molecule undergoes a transformation back to the ground state, reforming the original configuration. And we interpret this because it matches with our MD simulation as an ultra-fast isomerization around the single bond. But I cannot rule out that maybe the bond breaks, the molecule forms again, and that causes this ultra-fast reaction. We don't see it in the simulations, but it is not an evidence that it is not there. So now what we have is basically inference. We infer that based on the fact that in the simulations we have this ultra-fast repopulation of the ground state by the isomerization, we see ultra-fast repopulation of the ground state in experiment, but of course we don't know what happens. These two things together say we think it's this, and we have and the experimental data supports such mechanisms. But these are not fingerprints for anything. There's too much noise in this data. You would have to go to infrared, and that we have tried, but was very difficult. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, um, now, Gerrit, shall we, shall we leave it there? There are a few more questions, but we can leave it there and maybe ask if anybody would like to still follow on. Uh, they, they could perhaps uh, get in touch. Uh, that is fine. Yeah. People can write me an email. Yeah, okay. So they can find find your email um, on the Bioxel. So they can contact you. You're listed on the Bioxel website, bioxel.eu, mm -hmm. and also via your, um, your institution. And also Google. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, thanks everyone uh, for attending. We hope this uh, this was useful. Um, the uh, other workshops, uh, other webinars in the workshop will be advertised on the on the event page on the BioXL website. Um, we look forward to seeing you at at future workshops, at future <laughs> workshop webinars, I should say. Um, and thank you very much. Okay. Goodbye. Stay safe.